And welcome to this afternoon session. Sorry about the slight delay, just trying to get the technology as usual, trying to get the technology working, but we've got to go now. Um, we have two presentations in the next hour. Um, the first presentation is Paulo Santos, who's going to be talking to us about digital competence and we are readiness of teachers in three European countries. Just say that so you make sure you're at the right, straight, the right place, you're on the right one. Okay, without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for joining. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Paulo Santos. I'm a research assistant in the University of Southern University in Germany. Um, and today I'm going to talk about this research, some findings of this research that we conducted um, in connection with OpenTeach project. And then we're talking about digital competence and OER readiness in, of teachers in three European countries, namely Germany, uh, Greece, and Portugal. So um, I'm having this presentation. Um, we're having this project uh, along with Professor Weinberger, who's also here, she, um, head of the Department of EduTech. He's also going to talk about some interesting, uh, um, also research connected to open teach in terms of quality assurance and so on after this presentation. So for this one now, um, first of all, I think uh, we're all aware of the affordances and obstacles of OER and OEP. And then the, the background from where we started this, this project and this research was looking at uh, this connection of uh, OERs in the, in the, the movement of digitalization of, of education, right? So we know that OERs can be a catalyst for digital transformation in education. So OERs can promote this movement, but it's also, we believe it's a two-way, like this movement of digital, digitizing education can also help establishment of open practices and so on. Um, we know that um, through OER, we can also expand the access to high-quality educational content. Um, we can promote different learning experiences with teachers um, that are technology-enhanced and so on. Um, by this, we can encourage collaboration in different ways that technology can afford. Um, and we can support different um, ways of dealing with um, uh, different learning scenarios and support personalized and adaptive learning uh, and ultimately uh, promoting more uh, equality and uh, uh, access to education, right? So we all know this. I feel like I'm a bit, uh, preaching to the choir, but um, just to establish the, uh, the context where we started this. But like um, when we are... Um, when we're thinking about paradigm change and if OER and open education bring this kind of paradigm change, we know that this kind of move, movements would likely take time, right? And uh, this doesn't happen from day to night. And uh, we all know that there are some known barriers and studies that show these barriers to be concerns about quality, lack of relevant content in subject areas, um, also difficulty in finding OERs, time constraints from teachers and educators, also lack of awareness about OERs and the benefits of OERs, also copyright concerns uh, in each country and culture is different, there's these different laws and things that sometimes teachers are not, uh, do, do, also don't have the time to go after that, um, and sometimes intricate and so on, and also important here, uh, lack of necessary digital competence, which is one aspect that we focused on this first part uh, on, this, on this research. This is all taking place, as I said, in the context of this project called OpenTeach. This is an uh, Erasmus Plus project um, that we are focusing mainly on the, these three countries, Germany, Greece, and Portugal. And that the main aim is to, or the target group is primary and secondary school teachers. And um, our, the main goal is to, um, to empower teachers to use OER and open educational practices. And um, 
specifically by raising awareness about the benefits of OER, but also providing some guidance on how to create OER, how to assess OER. And um, Open Teach has mainly three pillars. We have online courses. This is a MOOC of different modules which we offer practical guidance on specific points like creating OER, uh, modifying, sharing, assessing quality, um, and so on. The second pillar here is offering through the platform that we have um, a place for teachers to, to share the, the, the resources that they have. So we're offering this collection of peer assessed resources and also um, offering also a possibility to teachers to connect, to share experiences, to um, exchange best practice and so on. To, to be able to, to put this forward, you know, this movement of, of open education. So basically this is open teach and in the, um, um, in part, as part of the needs analysis of this project, we wanted to understand the status of OER readiness in these countries. We wanted to see what are the obstacles that we could find in research were there as well. And, um, as I said, the, um, here put the research aims was to identify the needs that we had there in the specific group of teachers, also the challenges to OER adoption in these countries. We also wanted to get a better understanding on the link between digital competencies and OER readiness. So um, the questions that we were asking here is, First, the current status, what's the current status in terms of OER readiness? What are the teacher's perceptions in terms of the obstacles for adoption? And the relationship, what's the relationship between teachers' digital competencies and their OER readiness? For that, we had like an online survey that we had it run from September 2020 to August 2021, the beginning of the Open Teach project. Um, the, um, we had the, vari the, the items with these variables, OER readiness that were composed of perceived benefits of OER in education, plus the familiarity with OER and Creative Commons licenses. Um, we also have uh, an instrument for digital competence and for the perceived obstacles to OER adoption. All these were created for these projects. Um, the items were all in English at first and then translated to the specific languages and were um, participation was voluntary. The teachers were, were reached out by the, the network from the partners uh, in this consortium. So um, in terms of demographics, what we had here from the collection of data was a higher amount of teachers coming from Portugal than from Greece and then the least amount of teachers coming from Germany. Um, keeps wanting to go ahead. So um, in terms of the, their subjects, we had mainly physics, chemistry, foreign languages, and mathematics. We had two, 210 uh, participants in total. And here you can see their profile in terms of age, mainly the majority from 40 to 60. And um, so more experienced teachers, we didn't have, uh, we couldn't tap into these younger teachers. And also in terms of education level that they were teaching, mainly secondary uh, level with some uh, other um, representatives there, but mainly secondary. Now in terms of the results that we, we got, uh, in terms of digital competence, um, when we were comparing the countries, we found that Greece, um, the, teach, the, the Greek teachers were uh, scoring more in terms of digital competence there. So Greece was different in terms of Germ uh, in comparison to Germany and in comparison to Portugal. Um, um, in terms of familiarity, um, they were similar the three countries, uh, familiarity with OER, but in terms of familiarity with Creative Commons licenses, Portugal was, Portugal teachers were scoring less there. So I have another graph that can show how um, 
this situation is. Like you can see, uh, this is a count. You don't mind, uh, it's not proportional, right? Uh, I mean, um, these differences here should be seen because there are more people in Portugal. But still, what we can see is that in the three countries, we had a large amount of, or considerable amount of teachers that didn't have any knowledge at all about creative common licenses. So this means like no, not familiar at all to totally familiar. And in Portugal, you see the situation is more dramatic. The proportion is, is, is dramatic there. Um, perceived benefits of OER in education. In general, they all um, had a positive um, view on the, the benefits of OER. But German, German teachers were more skeptical. They were not so, um, in comparison to Greek and, and Portugal, German teachers were more skeptical about the benefits of, of OER. So um, now going to the results in terms of obstacles that they perceived, this aligned with the previous research, mainly time consuming, finding is troublesome, editing is difficult, which also relates to digital competence here and also uh, concerns about quality. This was not a surprise after all. Um, and then the relationship um, from, uh, between digital competencies and OER readiness, we found like a clear linear correlation between these, like in terms, uh, so uh, the more digital competent the teacher is, the more OER ready the teacher uh, is here. We don't know the relationship in terms of the causation and so on, but still it's a clear relationship in the um, medium uh, effect size. So going to the conclusions related to the first research question that we had in terms of the current status of teachers, uh, we could see that um, in terms of familiarity, they're relatively familiar but there's still room for raising awareness about OER, especially in Portugal, concerning licenses. Mm -hmm. Perceived benefits of OER, we could see that teachers are more lenient towards the positive attitude towards OER, but the Germans are still skeptical um, in comparison to the other countries. Uh, research question two, um, teachers' perception on the main obstacles, it's in line with the past research there, time constraints, finding, editing, and quality concerns. And uh, going to the third research question, the relationship, we found this um, positive linear relationship. Uh, and then digital competence could be like a limiting factor uh, in a teacher to be open to OBR. So we have a need to understand uh, more deeply this connection of these two variables. And then Coming to this, uh, I think this next, uh, this last slide here, um, just in, uh, important to acknowledge some some limitations to this study. We had an equal sample sizes, and even though we chose some tests that could make, you know, compensate for that, but still the the difference in sample sizes could somehow um, change the, the 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 profile of the data that we got. Um, also here, the representation, the focus, the majority were from secondary education and this uh, age range is also um, perhaps is the relationship from uh, concerning the age of teachers and, and digital competence. Um, this is also something that's needed to, to be further investigated in the future. And uh, here, one limitation is concerning the nature of these instruments that were self-assessed and not objectively assessed. So future research, we could investigate better the relationship between uh, OER readiness and digital competences, trying to understand uh, causal re relationships and, and perhaps other uh, variables there, mediations and so on. And um, um, to understand better these cultural differences, there are these different results that we got, we could also go deeper into some other factors that could affect these differences, cultural differences or differences in the education system and so on.
So, yeah, this is it for this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We've got time for questions. Follow up your opportunities. Thank you for the presentation. You've covered quite a bit the comparison between countries. I'm also interested in the absolute patterns for each country. So were each of these items on a Likert scale going from one to five, or what's the absolute scale there? Yes, uh, it was Likert scale from one to five. But then, for example, for, for this, for items like um, perceived benefits, um, it was based on Likert scale, but it's, a, it's like seven items and so on. So, uh, this was this your question? Yeah, for example, if we're looking at Portugal, um, how do I know is this high or low? Here? Yeah. Like, what's the scale of the perceived benefits? What's the max? What's the minimum? Ah, okay. Okay, okay. I understand. Yeah, so it's, it's from one, one to five. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's not zero here. It'll be one to, yeah, but it's one to five. Yeah, the five is the maximum. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, yeah cool. I, I would like to ask, uh, if on your yeah, in the first slides you told us uh, some reasons why we are, uh, uh, why you did this uh, research, and one of the reasons was the they couldn't, they couldn't trust the quality of the OER. And now, um, the way your story was uh, a lot about um, um, uh, uh, competence of the uh, teachers. So I was uh, curious, did you um, did you did any research about the other competence that you uh, talked about earlier? Uh, what, what other competence? Yeah, you, you told us that one of the reasons was that the, they um, well, it's sure they could trust uh, the quality, quality. of the OER. Did you do something to address that, or only did the research about the uh, competence? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. We, we didn't um, target this um, at this point. Um, basically, this this study was also to orient orientate the course or the project. What should we do, or should we have perhaps different approaches? For different countries there, and um, yeah, that's why the obstacles and so on. But at this moment, we're not measuring, or we didn't measure the uh, the perceived quality or how they perceive OERs or if they perceive it. But we have another study actually that, uh, but with a different population, that we explore that, and it's very interesting because we we also were wondering whether the mere fact of thinking as OER as being free, would this affect the perceived quality? You know, because this is free, so this the quality might not be so good, or so and so on. And uh, we did this in, in uh, students in Ghana, and we really found a difference there, that uh, people are influenced by this notion of, you know, when I pay for something, the quality uh, um, is higher. Maybe now we have time, maybe later we can discuss um, from the Netherlands and we have a quality model over there and we have one of our main goals is to increase the quality and use uh, with uh, OER and use uh, quality models for that. Amazing. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just wanted to know, uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor Paulson, very interesting to hear that. Uh, with regards to the two competencies of teachers, what factors did you consider that were measuring the two competencies? It was the competencies more related to, to OERs, and like create, I feel comfortable creating materials. I feel, I feel competent in um, adapting um, educational materials for my teaching, um, this kind of competencies that were taken from um, I guess Digicomp, Edu, I think, uh, and then it brought to the context of, of the art creation. And... Great. Okay, I think that will do for the questions. That's just right on time. Thank you very much again, Paolo. If everyone...
Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Armin Weinberger, <laughs> professor of education and technology at Southern University, and this is a little study I did with Paulo Santos in a project, as he was already pointing out, Open Teach, and you just might want to take note of open-teach.eu. There you can find uh, more information about our projects. You can also find a platform which, if you would use it, I would be most delighted. The only thing you have to pay is information. <laughs> Because it's not open completely, you need to register. That's all. And there you can find OER, like an OER platform, and also uh, a way of assessing uh, OERs. And that is what I'm going to talk about, because OER is clearly building on a certain philosophy of knowledge and education being public goods, for instance. And these are really like amazing values that OER is representing here, but it's not only values, or values only exist, not do not only exist in a, like a vacuum, but really need to be realized by activities and most, uh, and even more so, communal activities, like, for instance, quality assurance, assessing OERs, um, uh, joining in a participatory culture of, of sharing OERs and building community uh, by doing so. Um, and, and we think that, that there are different levels of OER activities, very plainly put, because we, when we're asking teachers, so what about your OER experiences, uh, we get uh, that the majority are using OERs, finding OERs and using OERs. That's, that's really, we're already there, I would say, mostly. Uh, but creating OERs, not so much. Uh, it's only a very, very select uh, uh, sample of teachers who would also create OERs. And we believe that in the midway of these two extremes, there's this notion of assessing OERs and sharing these assessments among colleagues. And that is what we're about. Um, we uh, here want to or what we did was basically we looked at different OER platforms and uh, looked at how they um, asked users to assess OERs and then compared these different ways of assessing OERs, these different assessment uh, tools, um, and looked at how they could be aggregated to make it more user-friendly. That's the basic notion more user-friendly in terms of actively using the assessment, that is doing an assessment, and more user-friendly in terms of um, the passive use, that is to uh, you know, get the most out of the assessment of others. And, and well, as I said, the notion was to go from comprehensive to comprehensible, because when we looked at these different international OER platforms, we found a large set of criteria that they were using. And in the first step, we aggregated uh, these and came to a much smaller list of criteria, which we found out these are criteria that they would be kind of using together if we would kind of like say, okay, um, the best of all of these different assessment kits would be resulting in this. But then we're coming still to a list that is rather long or would be typical of, of any one platform. And what we wanted to do in terms of, you know, making it more aligned with common practices, common online practices of assessing anything, like on Amazon, if you like, is to reduce that even more and then see if that would work or not. So, so this is what we did. We came to these four criteria. One is pedagogical and technical quality, or let's say overall quality, which is, of course, like if you're thinking Amazon, the main uh, um, set of stars that you would give to any one product that you want to assess. They're doing it the same, but if you're diving into an assessment, then they have different sub-criteria, and so do we, and that is modularity or adaptability, inclusiveness or accessibility, uh, and curricular alignment to what extent does the OER work for my curriculum. And of course, in this process of compressing all of these categories into this uh, small set, we then needed to lay out what these categories contain, hopefully not to 
you know, uh, um, uh, uh, opening the range again. So, for instance, the overall quality would comprise things as, are there any typographical errors in there up to, well, the technical aspects like, does it work at all, uh, and, and is it good pedagogy? Or the accessibility, is it in a format that can be changed at all versus uh, one that cannot, so think PDF versus Word document, for instance, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, on top of that, we then wanted, of course, to have um, a visualization of that or a design that is reminiscent of, as I said before, these common online practices of assessing something like restaurants or goods on Amazon, as I said. Right, and this is what we came up with, this star-based um, list. Of course, having an open item here as well, in terms of explaining the stars being given and also setting a title and such, and some background information about the review, which is, of course, optional. What we then did was to compare this uh, OTAT, the Open Teach Assessment Toolkit, with an existing, established, well-investigated um, learning object review instrument, the LORI, which contains, again, a larger or typical set of, of criteria to see whether it works and whether the users would be coming to similar results. So these are the questions. How do the teachers feel about the number of criteria that the OTAT covers? Um, to what extent do the OTAT criteria cover and correspond with the LORI criteria? Is there a match? Is that, is that uh, also visible? And to what extent lead OTAD and LORI to the same assessment? So are the OERs assessed differently just because you're using different scales? Hopefully not, of course. And then how is the open teach assessment to the OTAD usable in comparison to LORI? So do the people like, do the people feel confident when using the OTAD in comparison to the LORI? So to do that, we used a system usability scale, the SUS, which has items like, I find it easy to use, I, I find the rating system easy to use, I feel confident using the system, um, I felt it uh, too complex or unnecessarily complex, there was too much information, and so on and so forth. And this is again a relatively well introduced usability score, which then, um, um, results in, in a score that is, uh, if it's below 50% regarded as poor, um, 63 to 68% is average, and anything 80 and above is considered excellent. So, let's see. Research question one, what about the number of the uh, assessment criteria that OTART uses? Is it too much? Is, it, is the number too high? Is it is the number too low, and we felt like this is, this is quite right on target, that none of them, none of the teachers we asked was uh, having any serious concerns about the number of criteria and felt rather comfortable with, with, uh, with the, this small set of criteria, which again is less than half of all of any other set of uh, uh, assessment uh, 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 tools. Right, and here we have this match between the LORI and the OTAT criteria. So the LORI um, content quality matches most with the overall quality, but of course you can see here a little bit of a problem. It spreads out quite a bit. We don't go into detail here. The only thing you need to look at is how much range does it cover, because it shouldn't. It should basically match uh, very precisely. But, but of course, with content quality having being spread out across the range is, is of course, yeah, well, uh, um, somewhat more probable than with other criteria. For instance, learning goal alignment, it perfectly aligns with the alignment with the curriculum. 
of the OTAD. Or feedback and adaptation perfectly aligns with modularity, adaptability. And then motivation, again, of course, larger range here, but mainly, again, uh, corresponds with adaptability. Presentation, design, now this is how does it look and such, and this is, of course, covered mainly in overall quality. So the, the users, the participants of the study we asked, kind of uh, found it rather, uh, or, or it, we're rather seeing the correspondence, for instance, between interaction usability and accessibility or inclusiveness, or here the accessibility matches with accessibility, that's good. And the standards compliance also uh, matches with accessibility here. So there is a, a rather clear relationship between the categories. It doesn't spread out too much. When it comes to comparing the assessments themselves along these criteria, we found that there, were no, there weren't any differences, which is good. So regardless of what assessment toolkit you would use, you would arrive at the same conclusions about the respective OERs that we handed out to the participants of the study uh, to be assessed with the different uh, assessment toolkits. When it comes to the uh, SUS scores, we were happy with uh, finding that Lori was, was regarded as average or just average, almost poor, and, and OTAD was regarded as very good. And of course, OTAD also takes less time than Lori, which we hope would then contribute to lowering the threshold of analyzing or assessing OERs. So that leads us to the conclusion, OTAD beats LORI in usability with a smaller number of categories, whilst matching um, the respective LORI categories, and of course also arriving at the same assessments of OER. And hence, OTAD may be a contribution to making OER assessments feasible, supporting a bottom-up approach to OER use and assessment. And the whole idea of, of this project is to really create OER communities. And we found in this and many other European projects that participation has become the most valuable thing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, people are not waiting for you, but their time is the most precious thing. So, so this is where we are now to create OER communities, of course, through this, this uh, platform, and hence your interest and your attention is most appreciated. Thank you very much, and I guess I'm within time. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs>
seeing that that, that that doesn't lead to a quality reduction in terms of assessment was then very satisfying. And this other, this other uh, study then was a sample of uh, 26 participants, I believe, uh, also teacher students, and that was then, uh, 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 um, well, not randomized in a sense of that we're writing letters to all the German and Luxembourgish teachers, and <laughs> that's not really working, but in the, in the sense of, of uh, asking for, for uh, participation among uh, 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 student teachers and practicing teachers. Yes. Can I ask a question out of curiosity? And when you were saying that you wanted us to be user friendly, is that is that aimed at the student or the teacher or the institution or all three? <laughs> <laughs> but we weren't thinking about the institutions as much because we kind of are our own institution building that platform, which is free to use. So so we were not looking uh, for um, uh, institutionary uh, alignment of sorts, which is interesting because that's a whole discussion actually. But we were interested in the active and passive use. So active use in terms of the people, teachers basically, they're doing the assessments, as well as again teachers who are reading the assessments. Also not so much in students. Students are not excluded basically, they could join in and also assess OERs, but we haven't considered so much to address them as in terms of students of specific subjects other than education. So student teachers, student teachers, teacher students, um, so, so pre-service teachers would be well within our scope, but not students of any sorts that we haven't targeted. And institutionary inst integration is of course super interesting because in the course of this project we had um, established contact also with other projects who took a very different approach, which is maybe particularly pronounced in Germany, um, seeking institutionary alignment, let's say. Yeah? So, so basically seeking ministerial blessing. Um, and that results then in, first of all, the notion that there is not so much knowledge really about what is good learning material meaning also what are good OERs. It's not so clear, of course, any, any Ministry of Education within Germany, and Germany, you have to understand, is, is here, in terms of education, totally divided. So, so the, pol the education policy is, is, um, is uh, done by, by the respective federal states, and we have quite a few of them. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so they can, of course, and they do apply certain criteria, typically, uh, asking the publishers to, to take good care of specific, I don't know, interactive designs or uh, certain quality criteria, having an additional checks and of sorts. That is all very separated within Germany, so they can come up with a list of criteria. So it's not at all like a national approach. Um, but certainly the, the ministries who are, you know, buying ask for certain things uh, with the publishers. Now with OER, it's a whole different um, game, sort of. And, and of course, the main concern is then the quality as well, which is not really controllable. So, the, so, so many other projects took, the, took this other high road, if you like, to say, OK, um, we're trying to establish a set of criteria that the ministries can work with to assure quality of OER, which is kind of like a top-down approach. And that's valid and good. However, we, and that's the main message of my presentation, we took a bottom-up approach. Why? So one thing is that these online practices of assessing something are really common we do all have an understanding of what these star values mean, and we can work with them. Also, teachers can work with them on the you know, active side, but also on the receiving side. So that's good, that works. 
The other thing is, however, that we are a bit skeptical about the bottom, what uh, the top-down approach of of kind of like establishing quality criteria without taking context or specific needs, specific preferences of teachers into account. So um, we, we've seen a, a, a study of, of another study of, of OER uh, or teacher perceptions of OER and such, and, and it was quite pronounced that the teachers um, felt their perspective missing in this kind of ministerial perspective on learning material. So the whole idea of, of this here is to say, okay, as a teacher, I need something in my domain so-and-so, and what is important for me is because I want to get to a certain point, is that it's modular and adaptive, because I need to tweak it, I need to tweak it anyhow. So then I can look at this particular value, and I can make sense of it, and can make my own OER of it, because that is, one. Well, I don't need to tell you, one of the guiding principles of OER, that you can remix. And, and you can make use of what is in the written review to, to make the most sense and most use of the OER. And then sometimes the teacher-to-teacher -teacher communication is much clearer to the respective teachers than any ministerial guidelines. So, so the whole idea here is without devaluing a top-down approach, the whole idea is to fully use the bottom-up approach. To, to build communities of teachers to make teachers talk with each other and using OERs as a sort of mediator to do so. That's kind of like where we're coming from. Again, not saying that any other approach is, is worth less or something, uh, but, but, uh, but we also truly believe in this bottom-up approach here. Yes, yes. Can I, can I ask a to question? Oh, we've, sure. got, we've got time. I don't want to keep it very long after, but in relation to this, I, Question probably in an observation, and I'm looking at it slightly slanty here, so I might have mis misinterpreted it. Um, the categories there are, are subjective in that if I'm a, if I'm taking a resource or I reuse it and I'm a physics instructor teacher, and then if an engineer teacher takes the same resource, they might get to a different result in this in each of these ratings. So the ratings are only relevant within a context, either a culture or in a discipline area. And so how, and this is probably getting, I maybe missed something, how this would be used. So if, if our resource is assessed by 10 people and they all assess it quite differently, how does that manifest itself in a system that makes it usable for somebody coming along and saying, I want, is there a, is there a step or something that says the person who assessed this is a professor of physics or is a, is a professor of economics and it's been assessed in that view, in that context, in that country for that purpose. Because modularity is, you know, that's even subjective. It may be modular enough for one subject and not for another. It might be, uh, you know, what's the other ones there, inclusive in one country's context or one culture and, and maybe not in another. That's one thing. The other thing is, this is a this is a, a reflection from my from some work I was involved in. We developed a repository years ago in our institution. And one of the things we wanted to put on it was a star rating. And it created a whole big argument about star ratings. About what do you feel like when somebody gives you one star for your thing? How do you feel when you get one star? So you and then your somebody else gets five stars. And they're like, okay, star ratings maybe not the best the best way to go because there's such a range there and you get a one star or five star. So then we went from the thumbs up to thumbs down. Well, that was even worse because you could be all <laughs> thumbs down and no thumbs and that, that just looks terrible. And in the end, we couldn't put any rate. We couldn't rate anything because there was so much argument about what's the perception of that thing. And, and, and like I said, one person's one star and another person's four star because you've got to be able to assess it. And I think a tool like this is, as an individual user tool as a framework for assessing an object for reusability within the context you're going to use it in is a great thing, but I just, I, I 
can't get my head right in how you use it as a, a thing that, uh, that, that amalgamates a lot of different reviews. And I know it's a bit googly, a bit uh, Amazon-esque, you know, it's the power of the crowd, and eventually if you get enough people doing it, there will be some sort of, this thing is always inclusive, this thing is always modular, and some of those things are, but there'll be some of those fields that will, that will, that will, that will swing considerably, and you, and you would need a power, a power of the crowd, you need a big crowd to get it. Yeah, you, you need a big crowd, that's true, that's the whole point of uh, the wisdom of the crowd approach, that it's a crowd. Yesterday I've been to a restaurant that I used, of course, the yeah. star rating. So it was very, very useful. And and of course, if you're if you're um, um, competent in using the star rating as a passive user, you make the most out of it because then you see okay how many people have voted, um, and of course you would look into the details, the written reviews. There is no doubt if you would ask me before I go shopping. I look at the written reviews. This is the most precious. Of course, all of this takes effort, takes time. And, and then the question is, does anyone have time for the written review? And we're hoping that that contributes to them taking the extra time to also write some qualitative thing. The other thing you said was basically, OK, anyone can write anything. Uh, the internet is a dark place. And oh my god. And that's exactly the reason why we ask users to register. So you know who is assessing the OER. It's kind of the whole point of it, because when you do not ask for registration, then you're creating dark places online. Yeah? We're not doing anything else with this information, but just to make sure that people can understand that uh, if you're having like biology material and the physics teacher is, is assessing them, you might, you know, uh, um, think that the overall assessments of that teacher could maybe, uh, you know, be scrutinized yeah, yeah, yeah. to some extent. Yeah. So you know who is reviewing, and and we're taking care of that through that. That's the short answer. Yeah. I, th I think just one final comment to say there's what I find interesting about this. I think it's a great thing. A lot of the time we don't apply that kind of scrutiny to our standard teaching. Never mind our open. Education. I don't think we go through that kind of reviewing and rigor in, in, in the stuff that we develop for everyday teaching. And nobody's coming along and star rating it like that either. You know, it was a suggestion in our institution that everything should be star rated. You know, everything in our VLE, every VLE module should have a star rating. This this module has been rated at by the students. They have taken the module, so that prospective students come and they look at that and can see how. Uh, well, I don't think we do it now, but I think it's I think it's a great idea that we do it in open stuff because it is a big, as you say, quality is the big, the big blocker for staff when they go quality reusability modularity. Right. I just wanted to add to the, your question there. It's very pertinent, and in terms of how reliable it is if you look at terms like modularity and so on. So, in this new iteration that we are having now, we're actually adding some guiding questions, like for example. When we have inclusiveness, we're having some guiding questions. For example, if it's a video, does it include, you know, closed captions? If there is a yeah, photo, yeah, does it include? Yeah, yeah. So you can have some standard for yeah, voting, yeah. so you can get more standard response. Yeah. So this is one thing, and the other point that you also mentioned, which is very interesting, is, uh, you know, uh, what do you do with the one star? When you get the one star and so on, and we also looked at this how these star systems are uh, working and we see that many people are vote or give stars when the, they're very not sat unsatisfied or when they're very happy. <laughs> yeah. So we, we miss the, the middle point. And then one thing that we were considering but we're not implementing at this moment at least, but we were discussing this at one point and we're saying when someone gives a one star, then the person needs to put there necessarily why is this a one star because for some person i know i don't like the colors of this yeah. and then when you look at one star i don't so this is not relevant to me it's just a color and it also helps the other one because this is an oer if you put the problem i don't like i cannot understand the, the language so you can give hints for the next iteration how to make the material better yeah, yeah, that's really good. great great well, that's great right You're probably right on the 
Watson, um, thank our speakers, both of you, for an excellent presentation. It's really enjoyed them. Do you the one thing to add? Yeah, and maybe one shameless plug again www.open minus ttu uh, yeah. you can use the platform right exactly and there's also uh learning mat or material on on you know very basic stuff about oer use and assessment and so on so if you're ever in need of 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 uh you know teaching someone about oer there you find very basic <laughs> stuff and very extensive stuff i, I can recommend it. to you if you want to plug it a bit more if you go to the discord group that they're running and just put it up there. Just say, yeah. I want to publicize this, stick it up there. Go All ahead. right, yeah, then we'll do that. So then, thank you very so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all too for coming along. Great, this will be interesting. Thank you for the coordination. Yeah.